This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So it's been 20 years. Now fast forward 10 years from now, and in 10 more years, what's going to happen is San Diego is going to add about a million more people to our county, to this region. Tijuana is going to add about one and a half million more people. And if you are, first of all, I should congratulate our border folks out here. You guys do an amazing job. It's a really difficult job. And I say that before I say that the wait times are still a little bit too long for people in a hurry like I am, right? And you add two and a half more a million people and you can see the wait times keep on increasing. So uh, one morning, Jim Clark comes to me and says, you know what, we're creating this smart border coalition. We want you to be on the uh, board of that. I said, you know, Jim, I can say yes, uh, but I don't think I can attend every meeting. He says, don't worry about it, send somebody else. And so like Mary Walshock, uh, she, you know, her name showed up like fifth time in a row for me to send somebody, somebody else to a board meeting, and she's done an amazing job on that board. But one of the meetings I attended at that board, uh, of the board meeting, the conversation was about wait times. And what did we hear today? What was the expansion of the acronym? What was the secure electronic network traveler rapid inspection electronic i mean this is the age of internet of things this is the age of a new class of sensors rapid in this age means seconds and minutes and not hours uh, thank you and and the bigger we grow, the more our economies, between Tijuana and us, there is very there's significant inter and codependence than between the two countries. I mean, there's so much trade going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, that we really need to spend, save every possible minute. So I tell Jim, I said, look, uh, you know, as the chancellor, I have one of the best colleges of engineering, and one of my alums is a very senior person at this company that does like security systems and inspections, this company called Cubic, you know, it's like right here. So why don't we go get together and create a team and the goal should be to cut down the wait time by a factor of 10. This is not non-significant, right? Because I'm a computer scientist, we only think in terms of factor of 10. We go up by a factor of 10 or we go down by a factor of 10, right? So that's why, this envisioned the border team and the study came about. And Jim, thank you very much for your leadership. Uh, but the real leader out there who's going to introduce the next panel, Jose Laroque, who's the co-chair of the Smart Border Coalition. So thank you for being here and welcome. OK, if our panel um, will be kind enough just to step up here in front. And let me introduce you. Um, Matt Newsom, Senior Vice President, Cubic Transportation Systems. Jorge Sosa Lopez, Director of Excellence in Innovation and Design from CETIS Universidad. Ramesh Rao, Director of the Qualcomm Institute, UC San Diego. Uh, Rudolfo Figueroa, Baja California Director of INAMI, the Mexican INS and Pete Flores, Director of Field Operations, uh, United States Customs, and um, Dean Al Pisano could not be with us today, but in his representation is, and I hope I pronounced this correctly, Truong Nguyen, hopefully. Okay, so thank you very much. Well, indeed, what we face in these times 
uh, our challenges. We've had a significant advance at the border in infrastructure, and that too was the result of significant civic engagement by many of those that are here in working with elected officials to be able to get budgeting for this very important construction of our new port of entry in San Isidro. And we had work on both sides of the border because there was significant work also done on the Mexican side and we were able to align both of us to be able to create that very necessary infrastructure. With all of this, we have the great advantage of beginning to see results in the border crossings. But at the same time, border crossings, as they become easier to cross, are more frequented. And in being more frequented, we need to take them then to a different level. So we finish constructing, and now because everybody wants to cross the border or because they are efficient, they again become inefficient. And of course, we don't have a lot of real estate in all of the surrounding areas to be able to make the line even bigger. So we need to be innovative in technology. In 2010, the Office of Technology, Innovation, and Acquisition was established by CBP. So clearly, CBP has a focus on supporting ground personnel with inspections. Um, so a question to Pete Flores. Uh, is the OTIA's role also to make the border more efficient for its users? And if so, how can our community best engage them to help make the border smarter? Thank you. So, OTIA, as CBP, in kind of their function, is really to talk about what we have going on the border, what our requirements are at the border, and what technology or what, what's out there for us to meet the mission requirements uh, for us today or maybe even in the future. So they are kind of our go-to um, office for really some of the testing that goes on, some of the new technology, as we get a lot of requests um, as far as wanting to test or look at new technologies from nationwide. So OFO, we have 329 ports nationwide, and, and requests come in quite often to some very specific locations, but they also come in nationally. OT, OTIA is one of those offices that take in these requests and then talk to the vendors or uh, whoever that party happens to be to talk about some of the specifics of what they have available and how that applies to what our mission is, what we want to accomplish today or what we want to accomplish in the future. We have multiple avenues, though, really for um, industry or even the private sector to kind of get in contact with CBP and OFO. Uh, those of you that have been around at the border for uh, a long time, and I started on the border down in Calexico back in 1988. So um, had worked, worked on the border, uh, lived on the border, um, saw it firsthand, experienced both, both uh, from both sides as a traveler and as, uh, as somebody who worked at the border. And so when I first started, we really everything was a manual process, right? So people... People would arrive at the booth and uh, officers or inspectors back then would punch in names based on a document provided, whatever document that happened to be. Um, they, would, they would punch in that information. Uh, the cars would arrive and the license plate, it was a manual input of what that license plate was. Uh, it was all a manual process and how we tracked and what we did. Over the course of several years, we have implemented a lot of technology um, at our borders um, to help us become more efficient. So we started talking about RFID readers. Sentry was an important piece of, of how we facilitate and segment travelers coming through our borders. And as we continue to move forward to look for new technology and really be, become more effective and efficient at what we do at the border, I, I think based on what we know budgets to be in the federal government, we understand that it just can't be an ask on our end. It just can't say, "I need this more, uh, this I need this more, uh, this much more budget. I need additional staffing 
to help solve the problems uh, of congestion, wait time, infrastructure. We understand that internally, that we have a responsibility to be really, to take a hard look at ourselves on how we do business at the border and become more effective and efficient of, of what we do every single day for process improvement at the border. And today we're doing, we're taking multiple steps as far as technology goes. Technology is, 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 a, big, is a big piece for us. And whether that's a sentry lane and RFID technology with the ready lanes and pushing that license plate readers, uh, those type of technologies which we see today, uh, whether that is a mobile kiosk or, or kiosk that you see at pedestrian or you see at the airports in order to use that technology to come in, whether that's an app where we're looking at actually having an app for, instead of filling out, if many of you come across at an airport or even at a seaport, fill out that old customs deck, CBP deck, the 6059B. We are looking to actually have an app for that, to allow travelers to do that on the app as they park at the gate, uh, fill that out, and send it to us in order for us to process those travelers. So, uh, we're looking at... <laughs> We, we, we are looking at, uh, we've automated the I-94, made it electronic on airport arrivals. We are looking to do that for our land borders. So we are setting up uh, work groups to see what we can do about expediting that process on the I-94 end to really make that electronic in an automated fashion in order to help expedite that piece. So we have a number of initiatives out there that we, we have heard. I've heard from many of you here and at a national level, CBP OFO has heard from many uh, of the stakeholders and people that interact with about the need to become more efficient at what we do and how do we, how do we create a process improvement at the border, understanding that we have limited budgets, understanding that there's only so much room you can create and expand at existing ports of entry, how do we then, uh, how do we then process uh, legitimate travelers and cargo coming across our borders in the same hand, ensuring that we are securing and we are meeting our mission requirements every single day? Um, OTIA is, is a piece locally. Uh, I've had a lot of interactions of, of, of what that potentially could be as far as process improvements. But there, there is a specific piece on our CBP website so on our CBP website, down at the very bottom, uh, kind of in the shaded black area towards the bottom where it says about, there is a specific link in there that says doing business with CBP. And, and in that link there, it, it talks about unsolicited proposals. And in those proposals, you can give, and it gives you the requirements of what you have to meet and what, what they're looking for, the specs, requirements, and putting what you have available uh, to be looked at or to be talked about, and that goes t first to our Office of Administration. They're kind of the, the go-to where that's all processed in one area, then farmed out to the different offices that potentially would have to look at what that is and, and figure out the value of that to our current mission. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's encouraging to, to hear this. And uh, there are things that sometimes we don't, they don't, we don't really think about <clears throat> and yet they're there. And uh, we thank you, Pete, for giving us those comments. Let me turn over to uh, Rodolfo Figueroa from INAMI. INAMI is the um, equivalent of the INS or the Immigration Naturalization Service that now forms a part of CBP. Customs in Mexico is managed by uh, SAT, which is the Mexican Internal Revenue Service. Uh, Mexico has always been quite liberal in how we operate the crossings coming into Mexico. Uh, in fact, um, the automated system makes it relatively simple. I think it's just really a question of the amount of traffic that goes in through these random inspections. And those of you who have crossed have experienced this. So we have uh, significant traffic, mostly at peak times. Uh, but unfortunately, this is going to only increase as more people use uh, our borders. So we see that the inspections are more thorough for pedestrian crossers and that uh, long-standing policies in the ability to come in and out of uh, at least the Baja California area have changed. Will we also see, uh, Rudy, increased inspections into vehicles, and if so, what, what, uh, what part of technology will be played in this role? In fact, what part of technology right now 
is being implemented as uh, crossers, pedestrian crossers, are coming into Mexico to avoid the, this, uh, these long lines? Uh, thank you very much. The, the answer to the specific question is that no, there will be no, there will be no enforcement of vehicular lanes at this time. I mean, not in the near future anyway. Uh, Mexican law requires it, but our deployment at the border specifically with regard to immigration issues is not sufficient to handle the type of traffic that we're looking at. However, having said that, I'd like to put the whole question into, into context. Uh, we are, in Mexico, we're still dealing with the battle days when INS, like you had in the United States, when INS was part of the Justice Department and uh, Customs was part of the Treasury Department. So there is a dysfunctional relationship at the core of the way we handle our border southbound. And for that, I, I, many of you have heard me say it before, I think legislative engagement is necessary. It is not something that we at the local level, or certainly not the agencies, are going to be able to resolve. There is a structural issue that needs to be resolved in Mexico City, and at some point, legislatures for, I mean, in, of every party in Mexico should engage and try to get this resolved. Uh, with regard to technology, I can tell you that we're doing our best to incorporate technology to our jobs. We have already gone through uh, a bit of a growing, uh, a bit, a bit of growing pains with implementation of pedestrian immigration inspections southbound. Uh, one of the initiatives that is being rolled out as we speak is an electronic FMM form. It's not working quite as we would like it to be working, but it's it's a step in the right direction. It should be very, uh, it should be fully functional within the next you know 10 to 15 days. That is a step in the right direction. We're also talking to CBP regarding the possibility of running a pilot program so we can read RFID documents when people are going southbound. Reciprocity with regard to trusted traveler programs is some, something that we would like to, to see in the future. But again, these are issues that will not be resolved at the operational level. I think, again, oper uh, uh, legislative engagement and having both the Beltway and Mexico City be involved fully in what we do is important. So what we do is try to send the most reliable possible information uh, to up the, change of com up, up the chain of command and have folks like you guys help us with the lobbying necessary to make these things work better. Now, is there a technology department similar to the C at CBP? Uh, there is one, but you have to remember that the baseline is different. So uh, the asymmetries that we find at the border in every sense work in the same, w in the same way with, with technology, specifically with tech development. Uh, we would like to see uh, technological, uh, we'll, I mean, I ideally, and this, uh, this is me speaking, not necessarily agency speaking, but when, when we see uh, people in the tech departments in every agency talking about iris recognition or sophisticated ways to to manage the border that's great but why don't we just start with rfid readers you know they already exist we don't have to invent them everybody it's proven technology it's working quite well northbound so why don't we start there and that those are the kind of discussions that i think other people can help us uh, figure out Thank you, thank you. And that's a very good segue into, um, into our, our next panelists. Um, technology is, uh, is changing our lives, and it will also change the way that we move from one place to another, including at what times we do this. Uh, Trong, uh, could you share with us a little bit about how di disruptive technologies, which are addressed in the paper, can be a part of a solution to our borders? Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I have learned a lot by um, going to the border and talk to the, the agent. And uh, what we learned is that um, the agent is looking for an anomaly. Uh, they have so many cargo trucks, so many cars to, 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 to check. And the key is how to pick out this anomaly. So Jacob School Engineering has 200 faculty in various areas in terms of machine learning, big data, sensor design, um, as well as a lot of vision technologies uh, and robotics. So I'm thinking of what if we can help 
the agent by designing a system that look at different biometric signal. So what are the bi biometric signal? For, for human, it could be iris scan, it could be perhaps voice, it could be your ID and so on and so forth. What is the equivalent biometric signal for a truck, right? And we know that a truck going through the border is many, many, many times, hundreds of times per year. And right now they're going through without leaving any signal to us. It's basically a driver, the truck type, and the license plate. What if we take the sensor signal from the X-ray machine and produce a signature from that, right? Let's say at this time, uh, June, whatever it is, it's raining, the X-ray could look differently from the X-ray when it is sunny, and so on and so forth. But by tie into various domain, when you capture the signal, you can build a database. And from that, you can say, OK, now, today, exactly at the same time, the same signature, the same uh, parameters as in five years ago. I would expect the truck to look the same, right? Go through the X-ray. And from that, you can easily pick out, pick out the anomaly. Now, well, the X-ray is one, one signal you can use. But for big data to work, you have to have many, many signals. So what are the signals you can think about? Well, how about chemical? The number one issue that we have is to detect drugs, right? And drugs would leave, leave the chemical signature. What if you have a device, perhaps a flexible robotics, perhaps a drone, something that can go into the truck or outside the truck and just crawl around the truck? And if you look at, you know, you have actually half an hour from the time the truck check into the line to the time it take to, to see the, the, um, the agent. 30 minutes is a lot of time to map out the truck. OK? So, so that could be another interesting thing to look at. Um, this, this snake robot or, or something that could have multiple sensor, or could have chemical sensor, could have vision sensor, could have anything you can think of, and mapping out the truck. Right, so now you have this three-dimensional signal of a truck. If it's empty, if it's not empty, and you can map it through the good that it's bringing through, and so on. So my view is that as we have the technology, we have signature for every, every truck. And from that, it will make the life of an agent very, very easy. The next time it's coming through, if it's an empty truck, you know exactly how it looks like. And interesting thing here is that the agent tells us they pick out the truck from the dirt, the sediment of the tire. And sometimes they spray the dirt colors to make it look like the same. So if you have technology that can crawl around and just take images of the sediment of, 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 the, of the truck, here's the bottom, and compare the colors or the sediment, if they're going through the same path, you set exactly the same signal. If there any, anything is different, you can pick it out right away. So those are the simple, just for observation, we can design technology, you can design system that, you know, combining sensor, combining x-ray, could be vision, could be any signal into a machine learning algorithm. And it could dedicate per truck, per driver, and so on. So it looks like this technology that, that is, uh, I wouldn't say easily, but that can be developed, is right around what the Office of Technology, Innovation, and Acquisition is looking for. So just, we, we, we may have our constituents there. Uh, thank you very much. I'll turn it over to uh, Matt, uh, Matt Newsom. So using the existing infrastructure and looking again to uh, what uh, Rodolfo was, was, uh, was mentioning, so using the existing infrastructure, RFID he mentioned, there seem to be immediate opportunities to improve the border operations for pedestrian vehicles and cargo. Uh, can you explain a little bit about this? Um, so I, I work in a business in mass transit. So uh, it's, it's kind of funny when I talked to Pradeep the first time, you know, in mass transit, we're looking to shave milliseconds off of trips. And when we talk about shaving minutes or even hours off of trips, I don't know if that's exciting or scary, which one. Um, 
But, but there's a lot of correlation, and I think the way you use the existing infrastructure is the data that you gather from it. So w the way we talk about transportation in smart cities in the future is, you know, if you're in a big city and you have a way you get to work every day, wouldn't it be wonderful if you were kind of told the best way to get to work that day? That instead of maybe if you lived in the Bay Area and you were used to driving across the bridge using your toll, you knew there was a problem on the bridge, your phone alerted you of that. It said, you know, today's a really good day to take BART. And because you took BART, uh, I'm going to give you a couple free transfers. When I'm done giving you free transfers, you can go back and we'll make it all better. So it, it's really, we're, we're, I think we're already collecting a lot of data. And data is fun to make all those old graphs from and see what's happened in the past. But the key to the Internet of Things and big data is predictive analysis. Right? It's to be able to say what is going to happen with confidence. So you know, another, a couple other things that we could do is look at really the roadways. So this is already being done in, in Europe, all through the UK, and we're starting to see more and more of it in the United States. And that is kind of the control of lanes, off ramps, and everything combined with all that data. So a lot of cities are looking at making kind of command and control centers for all the data flowing into one spot. So how fast are the roadways moving? You know that by sensors on the road, you know that by sensors in the cars, you know that by license plates. What's the, what does the, the transportation network look like? How are the trolleys doing? How are the buses doing? Are the parking lots full? The same type of thing could be applied to the border. Right? So we know kind of what's coming, when it's coming. There's a command and kind of control center of where all that data goes to with algorithms, like we talked about, making some decisions, but certainly human interaction kind of taking those decisions to the next step. That, that's what's really exciting. Um, and it, it's, it's to be able to predict and use that data. So I think the other, the other piece that kind of separates is is even in our business, you know, we're about financial transactions, right? Our goal is to make sure that when people ride transit, they pay for the transit. I think the key thing here is security. And sometimes what technology does is it points out, you could put all the technology in the world in place, but you may have a policy problem that no technology is going to overcome. And sometimes technology tells you that, and you need to know that. And we've learned that in mass transit many, many times. We've tried so many ways to do things. And finally, at the end of the day, it's a policy, a procedure or something with the slightest of tweaks can make a exponential difference in what you're trying to do. So I realize there's a lot of, um, probably a lot of different types of security, but I think there's so much new technology that's going to provide so much data. But the key is to be able to bring all of the data together in one spot and then how you build that to be predictive. Thank you. Thank you very much. So a lot of work, I think, for us in the community because we have so many different um, stakeholders that, that are in the, in the border areas. Uh, it makes it complex. We have the federal government, the state government, the local governments, and then within those we have different agencies that address different issues. So we as, a, as, as, um, as stakeholders in this area have to kind of figure out just in a sense how Sentry did and how the studies were done years ago to try to move forward this technology. And the fact that all of this happened here in San Diego, where we have UCSD, where we have research companies, where we have institutes that allow us to have the technology to develop that technology is really a, um, uh, quite, a, uh, quite an achievement that can help us. So we need to really band together to figure out how to do that. Jorge Sosa Lopez from, from CETIS. So we can work on the immediate opportunities that uh, Matt was mentioning. Uh, but in the longer term, we would need a further evaluation of where we are. Can you tell us a little bit of what that would entail? Uh, sure, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, before I begin, I'm compelled to do a brief uh, commercial in context. How many of you uh, know CETIS University? Uh, show of hands. Oh, 
Excellent. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad the alumni uh, <laughs> that I see at the, at the <laughs> raise their hands. So um, Je I'm, I'm compelled to say this because if not, my, our president, uh, Dr. Fernando Leon, is going to give me a slap on the wrist. So um, uh, we are a, a non-for-profit um, academic institution located in Baja California. We have campuses in Mexicali, Tijuana, and Ensenada. Uh, we offer academic programs in, uh, at the undergraduate and graduate levels in engineering, business, and social sciences and humanities. And on the three campuses, we also have a high school. Um, our president is a very smart man, uh, those of you who know him. He's very smart, he's very proactive, and he has a global vision. Uh, that has taken our institution to seek out and obtain uh, accreditations in the United States for, uh, at the institutional level and at the program level. Uh, so we are accredited by WASC, uh, we are accredited by ABET and ACBSP. And this global vision and global focus that the institution has is uh, one of the many reasons we are involved in the uh, Smart uh, Border Coalition. And uh, we're very uh, glad and very excited to be collaborating with UCSD and other institutions in, in, this, um, in this project and initiative. Uh, the other thing is that uh, I think our president knows that I have social anxiety disorder, and I think that's why he sends me to these um, meetings. So uh, he, he's going to get a kick. He gets a kick out of these things. Um, so um, uh, re relating to your, to your question, uh, it's, it's very important to have a, a, a baseline reference as, as we move forward in, um, in, in addressing the, the, the challenges from a long-term perspective. So. Um, the, the white paper that was drafted by uh, UCSD in, in, in Cubic and where CETES University is also participating uh, states a series of phases uh, in which this is, is going to be done. And the first phase is uh, uh, actually a baseline and evaluation that's focused on two studies, um, I think two very important studies that should be done in parallel. A traffic flow study, which be, be, would be a, a comprehensive car, cargo, and pedestrian uh, traffic flow study to see uh, traffic traffic flow across the border and see how uh, technology impacts uh, and, um, and is affected by existing, um, existing processes and procedures and uh, technology. An environmental impact study. Uh, the, the, the white paper, if, if you have an opportunity to read it, uh, has a, a very important, very interesting section on, on the environmental impact of, of the whole uh, border situation. And, and that's, uh, th that's also uh, important to address, and it's, it's eye-opening. Um, so uh, a regional border uh, environment study uh, would also be needed. Uh, it is expected that these studies be done with the expertise and also uh, existing studies done by CBP, and also in collaboration with institutions uh, on both sides of the border, like UCSD, like Cubic, uh, like CETES University. Um, now, I'd, I'd like to give you a, a, a couple of things as food for thought. Um, I would call it in Spanish uh, chicle mental, that's mental gum. <laughs> Not food, because the, the gum you keep, you keep chewing it, so <laughs> chew on it. Um, first, first off, um, we're talking about innovation. Uh, I, th I think in, in the end we're talking about innov innovation looking towards the future. And when there's a discussion on innovation, we talk about technology. When we talk about technology, we usually relate this to hardware and software. And that's fine. Um, however, I think it's important to not lose sight of the humanware involved, the, the human factor. Um, in, in the end, the, 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 way, the, the way I see it, uh, we, we are global citizens um, that frequently visit and do uh, different types of interactions on both, on both sides of the border, on both countries. And we do this frequently. Uh, and in the end, I think what we, we all seek is a user experience in, in the whole border crossing process that is positive, that, that is good. Obviously, within the context of security and, and safety. Um, so I think that, that also has to be taken into account as we move forward and talk about technology, how we are going to interact with these new technologies to, to, to make it really um, something that, that, that makes the whole process more efficient. Uh, and the second um, piece of gum is, I'm, I come from Mexicali, actually. 
So my day started pretty early today. Uh, across the border, drove over here. It's going to end up pretty late because I'm, I'm going back. I'm very glad to be here. But um, like myself, many people from Mexicali travel over here. Um, Actually, in the football season, I do this every other Sunday because for better or worse, I'm a San Diego Chargers season <laughs> ticket holder and fan. I'm, I, I don't know what's going to happen if they... I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to even get into that. But uh, what I'm what I'm getting what I'm getting at is the following: um, uh, the issues that are being addressed and talked about here in the uh, Tijuana San Diego region are very important. I, I I'm, I'm I'm very proud and excited about what the, the the Smart Border Coalition is doing. However, I think it's very important for the discussions to be taken to other. Uh, border crossing points. The, the, the same issues that are addressed in the white paper uh, affect Mexicali in a relative, and I'm going to underscore the word relative, scale, because we are also growing in, in Mexicali. So I think the discussion should also be taken to, uh, and initiatives like the SBC should, should also be addressed in, in, in other parts of the uh, Calibaja region. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe USD can figure out an algorithm for the Chargers and or the or even the Padres. That would be. Um, I turn it over now to Ramesh Rao. Um, the uh, the paper talks about system wide modernization. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about the type of system that we could use to modernize our crossings? So. Um I'd like to take a minute uh, to look backwards a bit and connect another one of uh, Lin Sheng's uh, outstanding accomplishments uh, while she was here in California. I direct a research institute, which is one of four uh, institutes for science and innovation that was set up uh, in 2000. And uh, part of what we were called upon to do was to address exactly this kind of question. How do you use technology uh, not to just extrapolate uh, the trajectory that it is on, but make a difference in the real world? And transportation was one of the things that we had picked up on. Uh, hearing the, uh, how the sentry system was conceived, I'm uh, sort of tempted to go into all these gory details of our own. Back in 2000, those of you uh, who remember uh, might have been aware that Qualcomm and Ford Motor Corporation tried to create a new joint initiative called WingCast. It was supposed to provide telematic solutions so drivers and riders could get accurate information about what was happening, everything from uh, help if they were in an accident to finding out uh, traffic conditions. But that enterprise was ahead of its time, and as a result, we had the opportunity to hire some of their engineers when it went south. <laughs> And so, uh, talking about how do you introduce change, uh, you know, one of the things information technology allows you to do is to be really disruptive, uh, not follow the standard mechanisms where you try to build consensus through normal processes, uh, but just roll something out. Uh, uh, so we did what we knew to do. Uh, our engineers uh, who had experience in this, um, jointly with undergraduate students actually, uh, wanting to do a meaningful project uh, built this application. Uh, it was very prosaically named Best Time to Cross the Border. <laughs> uh, and what it did was it pulled information not only from the sensors north and south of the border, but also allowed for crowdsourcing. The people who are actually using this app can input information themselves. And uh, the latest version will actually, if you allow it to, track exactly what's happening. You don't need to lift a finger. Uh, it can tell when you are idling and how long it takes to cross the border. Interesting thing, hearing your story about how uh, Brooks didn't want to have a southern crossing. When this app was first uh, put up uh, to Apple, to put on their app store, Apple came back, and I'm reading exactly what their feedback was. Uh, they rejected the app, uh, saying it encourages criminal and reckless activities. <laughs> okay, so this app uh, could not go up on the app store. Uh, and then it's uh, interesting that Pete is here on stage. We dropped Pete's name uh, <laughs> and told Apple that CBP thinks that's a useful uh, piece of information to have. 
because as it turns out, they too would like to know how long it takes for people to cross the border. <laughs> and all the systems we have north of the border don't help you figure out how long you wait south of the border. It's an interesting thing. Who owns this problem? You know, Is it Highway Patrol? Is it CBP? Is it the US? Is it Mexico? Is it the mayor of Tijuana? Who, who, who exactly owns this? So I'm delighted to uh, also pick up on the human side of it. Uh, so there are 200,000 users who have downloaded this app, and there's 100,000 real human beings who use this. And the reason they use this is because they need to know how to get to work on time, right, when you have such a long commute with this disruption in the middle. So part of what the system is able to do is provide personalized information based on your needs, where you need to be, when you need to be. Uh, as uh, my colleague uh, Professor Trang Nguyen mentioned, you know, this is the age of uh, data science. Uh, you can gather and mash together information from multiple sources, and you can use it to predict, as our colleagues from Cubic are so good at with the Smart City Initiative, uh, how to get to where you want to be, uh, how to reroute people. Uh, you know, look at the larger system. You cannot segment this into piece parts and hope that the individual optimal answer will be meaningful at a, a societal scale. Uh, we also think that as these new systems emerge, sometimes it unexpectedly might serve other purposes. This community of border crossers, there are at least 200,000 of them, and we know where every one of them starts the day and ends the day. Uh, this community is good for many other things. It's not just border crossing they're interested in. Uh, so all of a sudden you discover uh, these communities that can go on to help address issues like uh, pollution, for example. You know, the health effects, uh, the loss of productivity that results from this. So I think, the one of, for me, the most exciting thing is the disruptive use, especially of information technology and cell phones, uh, which are getting smarter every day, uh, to address some of these uh, vexing problems that affect us both. Thank you. We're, we're just getting um, to, to the end of our, of our panel. And uh, for, for those of you that have, that have not had an opportunity to um, read this, it's absolutely uh, mind-blowing. It's so interesting, the technology that's out there. And um, you know, essentially, you'll have robots that are going to substitute attorneys, if you can believe that. <laughs> There you go. I think after I retire, but <laughs> but there's so much there's so much technology out there, and the fact that we're here in this area and that can that we have the resources uh, here in the university and the companies like Cubic that are so focused on these issues that we have existing technology. On that note, we will, we will end our, our panel discussion. I'd like, please, a round of applause for our guests. <laughs>